morning, CCSC. My name is Dan, and I usually serve as the youth director, and I'm usually leaving the auditorium with our youth students. But today, it's my privilege to bring us God's word uh, here at this, on our Sunday worship. We just finished our missions month last Sunday, and next Sunday, we will begin a new series in the book of 2 Corinthians. But today, I wanted us to consider an example of what spiritual and gospel maturity look like. What spiritual and gospel maturity look like. And for us, we're going to look at the letter of Paul to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. You can turn there in your Bibles or look at the screen above. And as I read this for us, uh, let's give this our full attention for this is God's word to us this morning. Romans chapter 12, starting from verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is God's word for us this morning. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as you've read your word, now would you open our eyes, would you open our hearts to receive your word, that this vision that you set forth for us for gospel maturity, that we, O oh Lord, would seek and desire that as well. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so today, we are considering what gospel maturity, what spiritual maturity for the Christian looks like. And so we have to ask this basic question, what is maturity? What does it mean to be mature? You know, a few synonyms that I think of, it's you know, to be mature is to be fully developed, to be completed, to be grown wholly and fully. And we often associate maturity with things such as increased knowledge, wisdom, experience, ability, or maybe the way that we feel. We feel much more stable, secure, steady. And sometimes this kind of maturity comes to us naturally, you know, for our youth students. When they wake up, if, especially if you have youth students yourselves, you see them grow a couple inches in the, overnight, and you're just, how did you grow so fast? Or maybe we just live and we learn as life gives us many different experiences, and we become more aware and comfortable of, with who we are. But while sometimes maturity comes naturally, sometimes maturity comes through challenges that we face, you know, especially for our college students. As you face a new year, maybe you're going to a different place. Maybe this is a new city for you, a new, t new school for you. Going off to colleges and facing that, those challenges there and growing there. Or maybe our jobs, our jobs challenge us, our jobs refine us, our jobs grow us. Or for those with families, you start a family, you raise a family, and you learn how to do it as you are raising your child. You know, it's safe to assume that all of us most likely don't want to be infants. We don't want to be immature, but we want to mature, whether in these areas or many different areas. And the question that I have for us today is what about our spiritual maturity? What about gospel maturity? What does that even look like? What does that even entail? You see, in Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us a vision for what it means to see Christians grow to maturity, not just to know the gospel, but to live out and live in the gospel. You see, this letter of Romans, Paul wrote to Christians who were in Rome during his time. The city of Rome considered to be one of the greatest cities of culture, commerce, and prestige. And these Christians, all around them, are opportunities for advancement and accomplishment. And Paul wants to challenge them. Paul wants to challenge us today to consider what does it mean to grow spiritually? What does it mean to grow in the gospel? What does it mean to find that gospel maturity? And so we'll see in our text that Paul gives us a vision for gospel maturity that all of us as Christians are called to gospel maturity. That's Paul's point for us this morning, that Christians are called to gospel maturity. And this vision of gospel maturity, which Paul lays out, includes growth in three areas. First, it includes growth in our worship, 
Secondly, it includes growth in our service. And thirdly, and lastly, includes growth in mercy. Growth in worship, growth in service, growth in mercy. And my hope and prayer for us today is that as we hear Paul's word, as we hear God's word spoken through Paul, that we would see the beauty of and we would desire to grow in this gospel maturity together. And so, so let's turn to our first point. What does it mean to grow in worship? You see, in the book of Romans, Paul goes to such great detail to explain the gospel. And then finally, when we get to chapter 12, verse 1, he writes this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Oftentimes, when we think of that word sacrifice, we think of the experience of losing something valuable, giving up something that we, in other situations, would want to keep, would want. But Paul here, when he talks about sacrifice, he's not talking about loss, or he's not focusing on loss, but he's focusing on sacrifice as an act of worship. You see, in the Old Testament, sacrifices were offered to God in order to worship God, in order to reflect his worthiness, and that's what worship is. Not just singing, not just the act that we do on Sunday mornings, but expressing and reflecting God's worthiness, expressing and reflecting God's worthiness. See, initially when we think of times like our Sunday worship, what do we do? We praise and we sing about God's truth. When we pray, just as Elder Young pray, we pray for God to make himself glorified as he moves in our lives. When we hear God's word, we are expressing with our hearts, with our minds, with our lives, God, I want to hear from you this morning. All these ways is how we worship. And while we tend to just limit worship to maybe just the spiritual or the church things, we see that the sacrifice as worship actually extends to more than just our Sunday worship. It extends to all our lives. You know, take, for example, if you value your health or maybe your physical body, you will most likely go to the gym. For you, the cost of giving up time and energy and being exhausted afterwards, it's worth it because of what you gain. You say that's worth, and so I'll gladly gift it up. Or if you're a music fan, maybe you go to concerts. You pay large amounts of money to just go see this person to get as close as you can. Why? Because you find it worthwhile. You find that experience valuable. You find that, ta- that person's talents so worthy of the cost that you pay. The more that we value something, the more we consider something's worth, the more we'll give up in order to get it. And that's what Paul is talking about because we all worship. You see, it's not a matter of if we worship. We all do. But it's more about who, how, and why we worship as Christians. Who, how, and why. Now let's consider the first one. Who we worship, it's pretty straightforward. If you look at our verse above in verse one, he says, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, again, this idea of worship, holy and acceptable to who? To God. You see, as Christians, our worship is a response to God's mercy made known in our lives. And the more we understand that mercy, the more we worship. And so that's very clear. Who we worship is God, but just as important is how we worship. Because you see here, Paul calls us to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. When he's talking about bodies here, he's not just saying, oh, you give up maybe just your physical presence. You come on Sunday and that's enough. Now, if he said that, he could say, oh, you just give up a part of your life, this portion of your life, one day of your life. Now, what Paul is saying here, when he says your whole, when your bodies present your bodies, he's talking about your whole life. Your whole life you give as worship, as a reflection of God's work. Why? Because God, you are God's work. We worship with our whole lives because we are God's work. As he calls that worship, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. You see, that's what God has done. See, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices we would offer are animals. We would just offer them in our stead, and they had to match God's standards. If they were an unworthy sacrifice, if they were a defiled sacrifice, if they didn't match what God expected, we would expect death. It would be a fearful thing to approach God's presence. But you see, because of what Christ has done, now in Christ, we who once were dead in our sins have now been made alive, we've been made holy, we've been made acceptable to God. 
Therefore, if God has redeemed us, made us alive, holy, and acceptable, then the natural response would be to worship God, to reflect what God has done as his handiwork of redemption. So you see, that's what Paul is saying. If the gospel is true, therefore, if everything that I've said, you agree with it, therefore, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. But not just this. You see, our worship is not just limited to our bodies and our whole lives, but it also includes our thoughts and our attitudes. As he continues in verse two, that he calls us to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You see, when he's talking about this world, not to be conformed, he's saying, don't think as the world does. Not in that we don't pay attention to the economy or any other topic that may not be directly related to scripture, but he's saying, don't think as the world does in that don't operate as if God doesn't exist or more so that God doesn't matter. You see, as Christians, God, had, God exists as he proves himself in our lives and therefore we cannot ignore that reality. We are called as those whom God has worked in, whom God has saved, therefore to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Let that reality sink into our mind. Let the truths of scripture, the truths of the gospel, not just remain as an intellectual exercise, something that we compartmentalize into our brain and say only for Sunday, but starts to penetrate all our minds, penetrate all our lives. As God's work of the gospel enters our lives and it affects every aspect. And that's what Paul calls us to do. If the gospel is true, this is what we should expect of mature Christians. And so we've seen who we worship, we've seen how we worship, but we always have to ask, why? Why does this matter? Why do we worship in this way? Why should we care? Well, because through our worship, we either reflect God or we reflect something else. And that makes all the difference. You see, this New Testament scholar by the name of G.K. Beale, he writes this, that people will always reflect something, whether it be God's character or some feature of the world. If people are committed to God, then they will become like him. If they are committed to something other than God, they will become like that thing, always spiritually inanimate and empty, like the lifeless and vain aspect of creation to which they have committed themselves. Now, if I were to summarize what Beale is writing here, put it simply, what we reflect in worship is also what we become. What we reflect in worship is what we become. And it makes sense, doesn't it? The more we think about something, the more we give our lives to something, the more and more our lives are shaped and fashioned and geared towards thinking about those things. And the more we find joy, the more we find satisfaction, the more we find fulfillment as we devote our life to things that we find valuable. But have you ever noticed that when you try to put your life, when you try to find your value, your worth, your joy, your satisfaction in anything that's not God, oftentimes you find yourself feeling empty. You know, we find good things. Maybe it's a specific person in our life, a friend, a significant other, or even our child. We say, they're so valuable. I want to make sure I give my all. Or maybe we find some other things that are uh, worth giving our time to, our jobs, our careers, this ideal that we have for our life. We want to see that. We want to grow. We want to excel. And none of these things are bad things. I want to make that very clear. None of them are bad things. We should strive to care for and excel in all that we do. But when we turn these good things into ultimate things, expecting them to give us all our joy, all our satisfaction, all our fulfillment, it goes well when times are good. I mean, yeah, we're, we're happy when times are going well, but what happens when you get into an argument? What happens when your child disappoints you? What happens when your job lays you off or says that's as high as you can go and that's all we want you to do? You see, when we try to make good things ultimate things, we recognize that they're not able to handle the weight of our worship. Either we will be crushed or they will be crushed. Nothing in this life that we can do or make can handle the weight of our entire lives to satisfy us, to sustain us, to ground us, to stabilize us. But you see, only God can do that. 
only God can, be, can bear the weight of our worship because when God gives of himself in response, he's never any less empty. And when God gives us of himself, we develop a hunger. We develop a craving. We develop a delight in wanting more and more of him, and he gives us more and more of himself. You see, Paul calls us to present our bodies, to be transformed in our minds that we may discern what is the will of God, what is his good, acceptable, and perfect will. As we worship God, as the Christian matures in worship, they come to understand what God's will is for their life. The more we worship, the more we draw near, the more time we spend with God, the the greater clarity and the greater closeness we experience. That's what maturity with God Maturity in the Christian life looks like. You you take any other couple, maybe an elderly couple where the husband will look to the wife and all he needs to do is make a sound and the wife knows, oh, he's hungry, you know, and then he provides food and she provides food. Or maybe the wife has a, a specific tone that she says or a specific request and the husband knows, okay, she needs me. See, that never happens with people we just initially meet. But the more we spend time, the more that relationship matures, the better we are able to discern the needs and the wants and the signals in our relationships with one another. How much more so with God? Not just another person, but the very creator, sustainer, and guider of the universe, the very God who calls us his own, wants us to know him, to draw near to him, and to reflect him. You see, when our worship is directed toward this proper object, there we find joy, there we find fullness, there we find satisfaction, and there we find maturity for the Christian. And so we see first that Paul, in this vision of what a mature Christian looks like, he says we are to grow in our worship. But he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't say, okay, now go figure out however you want to do that. But he gives us more concrete examples, not just growing in our worship, but also growing in in our service, which leads me to my second point. Because if we just read verses one and two, then we can think, okay, gospel maturity, I can do that. Now I know what I need to do. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go live as I just figure and fix myself. But you see, Paul quickly brings us out of this self-focus and helps to see that the transformation that we experience calls us to serve one another Because once believers understand the reality that is theirs in Christ, they are given a faith to believe and they are given a body to build and belong to. You know, he talks about this in verse three when he calls believers to soberly judge the measure of faith God has assigned. Here we understand that faith is not something we conjure up. It's not something we think ourselves into, but it's a gift of God given so that we can receive Christ given so that we could find our hope and our joy in him. And God gives us this faith to believe, but he also gives us a body to build up, as he talks about in verse four to five, that because of this faith, believers, one another, we experience a new reality. We become part of one body. Many members, different parts, different functions, yet one body and function. And you see, that's the reality that you and I experience. We're not just individuals here coming by ourselves and then leaving, but this is an expression of Christ's body here at CCSC. One body in Christ, united to one another. And the thing is with the body, you need all these different parts to work together. Take, for example, the hand, right? You could do many things with the hand. You can grab things, push things, pull things, find motor skills, all of those things. The hand seems like a very great great organ, great part of the body, but what happens if all of a sudden you lose the ability to see? No matter how great the hand is, it can't function properly because it does not know what to grab, how far to go, what is in it. It's just guessing. No matter how great the hand is, if it doesn't have the eye, then it will never function to its full potential. Or take, for example, if your heart, may organs, if your heart is strong, but maybe the vessels are weak, You realize that the body can't function. It encounters difficulty. It encounters stress. And look at Paul's language, what he talks about us. If we understand that with our physical bodies, he says, verse four, we have many members, 
So we, though many, are one body. And lastly, in verse 5, individually members one of another. What's Paul's point here? Not just that we're one body, but that we all experience this unity and are called to live out this unity. I like how the way that R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul puts it, that through unity and diversity, grace is given to everybody in the church. And everybody in the church has a role to play. That's what the late R.C. Sproul wrote. That though we are diverse, we are still united. And that grace is given to everybody so that everybody in the church has a role to play. That means you have a role to play for the people next to you. That means you have a role and you have the ability to help another function and help another grow. That means you have the ability to take the gifts that God has given you and to build up the body of Christ. Because that's what the body is designed to do. It's not designed to say, oh, I am fine by myself and now everyone else can figure it out. But the body of Christ is united together and builds up together as it experiences the gospel at work. It becomes a vessel, an instrument for which the gospel tangibly is experienced by the rest of the body. And when that happens, when all the members are working together, man, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. You know, I, I used to grow up watching team sports such as football because I really liked seeing teams score. That superstar catches that ball. He runs down the field, touchdown. I get super excited. And when there's not much going on, I, I get very bored. That was me when I was younger. But now that I've grown and now that I understand the game a little more, I'm amazed at how those players on the field can somehow work together to move that ball forward. You know, we think it's very simple. But when you take so many different people, so many different positions, so many different roles, and they all come together to accomplish one goal, wow, that's, that's worth cheering for. That's worth wanting more of. That's worth experiencing. And if that's true of the body, if that's true of teams working together, how much more true should that be of the body of Christ? And each and every single member gifted by the grace of God is contributing, is acting, is engaging and building up one another. You see, Paul gives us a list for us in verses six through eight. And he says this, that having gifts that differ according to the grace given to them, let us use them. And I've listed a couple of them. I've just kind of summarized what these gifts are. But take a look at this list. Some of them, maybe you're like, oh, I can never imagine myself doing that. For example, inspired preaching of God's word, getting up on a stage, I'm afraid of public speaking. I never want to do that. And that's fine. But there's other gifts. Maybe you're given the gift of teaching. Maybe you're given the gift of leading. Maybe you're given the gift of showing mercy and care. You see, many different parts, one body, and imagine if all of these, even this incomplete list that Paul gives us, Imagine if all of them are working to build up one another. Imagine how beautiful that looks like. Imagine what a witness that is to the world, the encouragement that we would have. You see, maybe you might not see your gift on this list, but let me make clear what Paul is teaching. Every Christian is given a gift. Every Christian, if given faith, they are also given the grace and given the gift, regardless of how small, regardless of how rusty or maybe not used recently, you still have a gift. And the only way that we grow as mature Christians is if we use that gift, is if we exercise that gift, if we bless one another, encourage one another with the gift of grace that we've been given. You see, we shouldn't focus on how big or how small our gifts are, but the focus of gifts is to build up and to raise one another. That's what Paul is encouraging the body to do. Not just worship by themselves, but to be able to raise up, live in this reality that we are a church, we are one body, and we are called to reflect in our worship and in our service this new reality that we are one in Christ. And so if I stopped here, if all I said was, okay, you need to worship, more, you need to grow in worship, you need to grow in service, 
Again, we could leave here and say, okay, now I know what to do, and we can just go on with our lives, try harder, do better. But that wouldn't get the entirety of Paul's argument. You see, here, although he's talking a lot about what it means to grow in worship, what it means to grow in serving one another, that would be no different than a TED Talk that you would get down the street. Just do more, do better, think better. What makes this different? What makes what Paul is saying different is that we're not only to grow in our worship, not just grow in our service, but also to grow in mercy. And that leads me to my last point. What is this growth in mercy? And you see, when I talk about in mercy, I'm making it very clear. It's not our mercy for one another, which is very important. I would argue that we need to express mercy. We need to have mercy for one another. But when I say growing in mercy, I'm talking about growing in the mercy that Paul talks about, the mercies of God. Because we have to remember Romans 12 comes after 11 long and detailed chapters where Paul is focused on one thing and one thing only, the mercy of God expressed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just, okay, you, you guys remember the gospel, and now let me give you a list of everything you need to do. No, he spent so much time on the gospel because we still need to grow in that. It's not something we believe first and move on and figure out the to-do list. It's something we learn, something we remember, something we revisit again and again and again. Why? Because that gospel, that grace we've received, reframes the Christian life. It reframes us from a thinking of how the world thinks, of how everyone else around us thinks, and reminds us and points us again to this mercy, the mercy of Christ. And you see, Paul alludes to these things, not just in verse one when he says, therefore, looking back, but he also alludes to it in verses three, five, and six when he says things such as, by the, God, by the grace given to me, Paul, an apostle of God, an authorized speaker, he doesn't point to his eloquence. He doesn't point to his record. He points to the grace of God at work in his life. That's what he calls, that's what he points to. The grace of God, this undeserved grace. But not just in his life, look at verse six. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Not just gifts we develop, not just gifts we have, gifts we've received according to grace. We have become one body. You see, our living and our worship and our serving all comes as we grow in the mercy of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul appealed to earlier. And that's what Paul wants us to grow in because we have to recognize what is this gospel? This God of mercy was not always the God of mercy to us. In fact, in order for him to be a God of mercy, first, we had to be those in trouble. Mercy is only mercy is when we are rescued from danger, when we are rescued from trouble. And what does Paul talk about in Romans 1 to 11? That God was first a God of justice, and we were originally a people of sin, a people undeserving of goodness, a people in rebellion, a people conformed to this world, a people who said we want nothing to do with God, and therefore we all fell short of the glory of God. Not a God of mercy, a God of justice, righteous justice. And we were people guilty, liable, undeserving. But here comes the gospel. If that was the truth, that we were people sinful, deserving of only death, only polluted by sin, dead in sin, God sent us someone. God sent us his son. God sent us his savior, Jesus Christ, who was not conformed to this world, but perfectly and wholly transformed and renewed in his mind. He could discern perfectly the will of God. He alone deserved all the blessings that we would ever want. All the blessings that God would want for his people, he deserved. But what did he come as? Not as a king to establish a physical kingdom. He came as a servant, he came humbly. He came so that people like you and I who were so conformed to this world could yet somehow find hope for transformation, hope for life. And what Christ did, he came as a sacrifice. 
gave himself on that cross, laid down his life, presented his body as that sacrifice so that by his wounds, you and I would be healed. We would be whole. We would be cleansed. There would be no sin, no guilt that could cling to us so powerfully because the blood of Jesus Christ would be more powerful, would be more powerful to cleanse us from all sin, all unrighteousness, all guilt. See, by his obedience, we who are dis- disobedient are now changed, are transformed, are transferred from death to life. And Christ lived, Christ died, but the gospel is also that Christ was raised from the dead. That Christ was raised to life as the blameless son of God and now all who believe in him, not just the sacrifice, but the living, the holy, the acceptable sacrifice from God, all who believe in him will also become the living, the holy, and the acceptable ones before God. That's the hope of the gospel, that we are renewed, that the power of transformation not, does not come from our ability, but it comes from what God has done in us. And now we are called to reflect that in all that we do, in our worship, in our service. That's what the mature Christian does. That's the vision of the mature Christian Paul sets before you and before me, that we become mature, Christians mature as we grow in Christ's mercy for us. That's Paul's point all the way through Romans, and that's the foundation of everything that he calls us to do here. Every aspect of the mature Christian that he lists in chapter 12, it's that Christ's mercy. It sets the foundation for which we grow in and we build off of. And for the Christian, let me make it clear, this gospel maturity is not optional. It's not optional. Because if Christ really did live, die, and was raised, if God really did unite us to his body, the body of Christ, then therefore we are called to respond. Again, it doesn't have to be amazing things, but we've all been given gifts. We've all been given opportunities. We've all been given a body to build up, to serve, and to reflect the beauty of that gospel. See, that's why we grow in mercy. That's what, because when we do that, then we can grow in our worship and in our service. They go hand in hand. And so let me close with this. You see, Paul sets for us a vision of mercy, that we would mature not just as children tossed to and fro by the waves, but grounded in God's mercy, built up in God's mercy as we grow in our worship and in our serving. And my question for you today is, does this vision of spiritual maturity Is that a vision for your life? It's what Paul wants for Christians. It's what Paul sees as a natural consequence of believing the gospel. And Paul challenges believers. This is what we are called to do. Not simply because it's the right thing, but because God first did that in us. It's an invitation to know the the grace of God, not just in our lives, but as he works in and through us. And so CCSC, brothers and sisters, my hope and my prayer is that we would not simply hear this challenge and move on, but we would consider, what are our gifts? How are we worshiping? How do I understand the mercy of Christ? Would we be a church that is known to be mature in the gospel, reflecting it and seeing the beauty of that gospel at work as we love one another and live for his kingdom glory? That's what Paul wants for Christians. And that's what Paul calls us to live for and pursue. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray and ask, God, this vision of gospel maturity, God, we need to know you. God, we need to see you. First, that mercy that we've received in Christ. And so, Lord, I ask and I pray for these brothers and sisters of mine that you've given in Christ, that, Lord, you would grow us in our understanding of, in our experience of, and our trust of this mercy in Christ. Lord, would you be honored and glorified through all that we do? Would you be glorified in our worship and our serving and in our trust? That we may know you and that we may come to see that you are a good, perfect, good, perfect, and loving God. And so God, we thank you for this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.